Welcome back to another edition of the Edge Podcast. Publisher Brendan Slaughter here for BeaversEdge.com, joined by Beavers Edge writer and KEJO radio host TJ Matthewson. We're coming to you midweek following Oregon State's win over Stanford. We'll get into it, the craziness, the unrealness, and just flat out the, you know, uh, shocking finish to that game down on the farm. And uh, obviously preview uh, Oregon State's matchup this Saturday against Washington State as the Beavers are back in Reister Stadium for homecoming. Again, Brendan Slaughter, thanks for joining us here on the podcast. TJ, how you doing, man? I'm good, Brendan. Uh, entertaining football game on Saturday, I will say. We're I, I was sl- I was concerned because I, I we were a minute away from really you know a DEFCON one situation yeah. of uh, high expectations Uh-oh. and three and three yeah uh oh but Trey yeah. Sean Harrison saved the day one of the best plays I've seen from a wide receiver in college this year reminded me so much of the Stephon Diggs play in the playoffs yep. in 2017 I mean almost exactly similar. Uh, you know, the safety comes running up a little bit too aggressively, tries to get in front of him, and ends up way behind him because yeah. they, they make the catch and they, they turn around and there's no one in front of him into the end zone. But a really unbelievable play, and I feel like the best way that game was put, one of our callers on the post-game show said, you know, it really was like a, a D game, a real, like a D, yeah. D, D grade game with three A-plus plays that really saved the day. That fourth down touchdown yep. to Silas Bolden. The, the long touchdown run from Damian Martinez and then the uh, and then the game winner from Treshawn Harrison. That really saved the day, and sometimes that's all you need. The good teams figure out a way to win, and that's right. what the Beavers did. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, again, as TJ alluded to, Oregon State getting the 28-27 win over Stanford on the farm with Treshawn Harrison uh, scoring in the game's final moments on a – I believe it was a 54-yard touchdown. 56. Uh, 56 good call uh yard touchdown pass uh, from ben Golbrinson. uh we'll get into kind of the nuts and bolts of the play itself and all that as the uh, as the podcast goes but just on the surface tj like you said the difference between four and two and three and three i want to talk about that and then i also want to talk about where do you kind of stand on this game because it seems unfair to say you know oregon state didn't deserve to win the game because they made plays right but yeah, you get right. where kind of that sentiment comes from, and where do you arrive with that whole if, thing? If we look at the whole game as an aggregate, it was a bad performance. Right. It, it really was. So, you, you first of all, you start off with Stanford's weaknesses, turning the ball over. I mean, you turn the ball over there at the end uh, yeah. on really just a desperation throw from Tanner McKee. But really when the game was in, you know, just in sort of a neutral state, you didn't do that. You didn't nope. take advantage of a bad offensive line. Did not – I don't even know if they touched McKee or hit him very many times, let alone – they didn't sack him. I know that much. Yeah. Um, on the other side, I mean, the running game was was pretty bad until Damian Martinez ripped off three big runs, three carries right. for 83 yards and a touchdown. That I, – how I don't know how much the, that brought up the, the Beavers' uh, yards per carry, but, you know, entering the fourth quarter, they're averaging three yards a clip on the ground. Against right. a terrible run defense, just an awful run defense. Yeah. Um, that we talked about, TJ. We sat here yeah. a week ago and we're talking about how the Stanford run defense was vulnerable. That's the Oregon State's bread and butter, and it just was not clicking. Yeah, and they were they're trying, you know, there it was a lot of it was a lot of jam and a lot of Fenwick. And that that combination just didn't really seem to get much off the yeah. ground. Jam had had a run here or there, but otherwise right. it really wasn't, you know, explosive at all. But you Damian Martinez and all of his three carries mm. <laughs> got 83 yards on his own. So it's right. like, huh, well, he was a better matchup for that as well. Uh, and then, you know, the passing offense was, as you would expect, I guess. Right. It, it, it looked like there was a backup quarterback in there. I mean, it looked like there were some jitters from Goldbranson. He didn't turn the ball over, which is a plus. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily explosive. It wasn't anything really out of this world until those fourth quarter plays. It was just kind of, eh. And then uh, just, I guess, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else. I I can't really off the top of my head. It was just a very overall underwhelming performance against a team you should probably beat. Yeah, and I think we kind of, and and maybe you'd agree with me, that was kind of the tone, TJ, that I had gotten from Jonathan Smith's press conference on Monday was that tone of like, yeah, we, 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 we 
you know, for lack of better terms, dodged a bullet. You could tell Smith, you know, self-criticizing himself, going back and talking about, you know, how he would do some things over again, do some things differently. I think he used the term we are learning as coaches three or four different times uh, in that press conference on Monday. So, you know, I, I, I think to an extent, like what we talked about last week when I said David Shaw specifically and Stanford still deserves a healthy amount of respect going into each and every contest because they're so well coached. You talked about TJ, how they still have a lot of talent down there Mm -hmm. um, last week. And I think a combination, you know, I I personally think Oregon state played down a little bit. I don't think the coaches gave them as good of a game plan as they could have. I don't think the players were necessarily put in great positions. Mm -hmm. I think several players being Silas Bolden, Damian Martinez and Treshawn Harrison, you know, players make plays, players win games kind of a thing. Like, I think those guys made three really outstanding individual plays. The defense obviously locked in as the game went on, but I also have this this feeling, TJ, of like, at the end, like, no, that's how you're supposed to handle a Stanford offense that's not explosive at all, right. for lack of better terms. Do you kind of agree? Yeah, and again, I thought the defense was – fine i mean the the secondary was again fine they got an interception there at the end there was no pass rush to speak of at all uh i don't have let me see the did i pull up the stanford rushing numbers uh let's see here um oh 90 yards rushing on the ground okay so that's fine so i mean yeah the oregon state front was was fine right um and then you know they made a couple plays there at the end but they did allow stanford drive all the way down there at the end and get the get a field goal there when right. they kind of needed to get him off the field and got bailed out because of that Trey Sean Harrison play. Another thing that we haven't even mentioned again, uh, Brendan, the kicking game. Uh, I'm yeah. Big. Sappington missed two kicks, both very yeah. makeable. One of them got called back due to a penalty and he made the next one. Yeah. But mm, I, we we're talking to, to, to what Jake Kugis. Yeah. It's Jake, right? nope. Yeah. It's Jake. Yep. Okay. Uh, today and they said Oregon they're confident legend, in, TJ. yeah I, they're, I, they're I, talking I, about uh you know that they're confident in Sappington making a variety of kicks and he said you know and da- Nick Dashel from the Oregonian asked him long kicks and they said yeah and he's like okay so what how long and he said well you'll see which was like mm, okay because we saw yeah. long longish kicks that he missed on Saturday in not a hostile environment, right. not tough kicking conditions. Um, and that could cost you. So I, that's just another thing that just kind of, kind of jumped out. You left some points on the board and there at the right. end with the fiasco with the two point conversions, hmm. um, some interesting play calling, no Jack Colito on either any of those yeah. three two point conversions, which yeah, that, that's are the my, excuse last week. The excuse last week was, well, right. we're, we're too far out from the end zone. We're at the 10 yard line. Okay, I guess. But then this week you have three yeah. two point conversions. <laughs> and yeah. And I'm pretty sure if I'm not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, TJ, I'm pretty sure Coletto not only wasn't involved, wasn't even in the game for any of those plays. Yeah, I don't think so. I think they might have, they had, maybe I they snuck was, him um, in for, yeah, maybe they snuck him in for one and I missed one. But again, going mm-hmm. back to my point earlier, how, I just generally feel like the coaching staff did not put the players in the best position to win that game. Case in point, how you don't have Jack Coletto, not once, not twice, not three times uh, on two point conversions after what we talked about last week, I I think is, you know, inexcusable. And I think it was just, it was a puzzling game. There were some really puzzling decisions. Another week of kind of, you know, uh, erratic play calling Would that, would that kind of be, just it just kind of all over the place like you know uh Stanford I feel was setting Oregon State up for a screen we didn't see a whole lot of screens I just it 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 seemed a little I don't know what the quite word is for it but you know heading into this week TJ I'm curious to see um whether or not Chance Nolan is ultimately able to practice or if we're looking at Ben Goldenson for another week and obviously as you mentioned whether or not Everett Hayes, who Jonathan Smith also mentioned uh, on Monday, is able mm-hmm. to uh, get back into the fold or if we have another week of of, um, of Atticus. But before we get into that, I just kind of want to get your final thoughts on that game, that self. Have yeah. you ever seen, like, like, have you ever seen a play that, you know, equ- like, 
stands with it. Like for me, it's for me, it's it's up there as like you know, as far as an Oregon State quote unquote walk off, which it wasn't quite a walk off because there was time left. I mean, it, it it's up there, like probably top five, you know, greatest finishes to an Oregon State game that I've seen. And with like you said, it, it I immediately thought of Stephon Diggs when it happened. Yeah. Um, in terms of games I've covered. Not really. I guess the, when I was at ASU, I got to call the ASU Oregon game in 2019 where Brendan Ayuk just oh, yeah. torched the Ducks defense there yeah. on, the, on a third down and 18. That was probably about as close as I could come. But ASU was leading that game by three points at that point. They were not Kept trailing. Them out of the playoff. So, yeah, it did keep them out yeah. of the playoff. And uh, yeah. uh, in terms of a game where the team was behind and a miraculous play comes ahead in the Stephon Diggs plays, I, I, I think the perfect – uh, the, the perfect comparison to that play because they, they're just so similar uh, yeah, in that right. sense. I will say one more thing about this game on the uh, for thoughts. I thought the Oregon State defense was bailed out by just Stanford's just just mind-numbingly conservative play Oh, my call. gosh. Yes. How many fourth down and ones is David Shaw going to punt on? <laughs> fourth down and not even a yard. And well, and it'd be the same thing. There with, be- without, even, without a second thought. I mean, respectfully, TJ, I think you and I could have called defense against David Shaw's offense because it was shotgun snap, McKee, you know, faking it through to Philkins, seeing if he can, you know, do a bit of an RPO and then just putting in the belly of Philkins. Like yeah, every and, and other the, play. Like, the slow mesh was like very, I don't yeah. know, it seemed like they only threw it in there half the time. I all I heard about it all week, so I went, you know, looked at a little bit of Wake Forest and what they run, and they do it like every single play. Stanford did not. Yeah. Um, so that was like interesting to see, but I thought like the Oregon State defense got let off the hook a couple of times because David Shaw, anytime a four flashed up next to the down marker, he was sending the punt unit on literally without even thinking about where it was on the field. It, it, as well, if it wasn't in field goal range, he was going to punt yeah. the ball, which I thought was very curious. But it helped out Oregon State, and they won. Sure did, sure did. You you know what's that old saying? Um, you know, I think it, I think it uh, I think it goes all the way back to like you know the art of war, but it's never interrupt your enemy when they're making a mistake. Right. Yeah, and it's, yeah. and it's like, you know, it's been a pretty, you know, th- theme in human, human culture forever. If your opponent's going to go make mistakes, you don't go, Hey, you know, stop making mistakes. So I'm sure Jonathan Smith for all the maybe things he would like to have back in that game, TJ, he's probably like, mm-hmm. appreciate the conservative play calling David. Thanks, yeah. Man. And, and, and the next time you complain about Oregon state going for a fourth down, like just yeah. think of that. You could, you could have somebody who almost never will go for a fourth down unless, unless it's literally going to cost you the game at the end of the game. Uh, he won't. I mean, yeah, and you could get away with that, David Shaw, maybe in like 2015 when your team's unbelievably good and you know, right. you're know you you're that much more talented and well-schemed than everyone else. But when everyone else is kind of you know caught up, I mean, just yeah. doesn't – that isn't how the cookie crumbles nowadays, play calling-wise in, in the NFL and college. I mean, you have to be aggressive and – being yeah. aggressive has won the Beavers games. It won them the Fresno State game, et cetera. You can go down the list. So, you, yeah, you just it, that doesn't really cut it nowadays. Certainly. And, and again, it's one of those that Oregon State will, you know, look back with a smile on their face and, you know, kind of a thing because it, it, they, they dodge they dodge one. But, you know, I think players make plays. And I think in this particular game, they had some studs step up, and that's the reason they're sitting four and two right now. Let's go ahead and transition over to uh, the matchup this Saturday, TJ. Washington State Cougars coming to Corvallis. Uh, Beavers are a three and a half point favorite in this game for the 6 p.m. kickoff. Homecoming, some cool, uh, uh, not necessarily uniforms, but helmets. I saw mm-hmm. them. I saw the out. helmets. Those look very nice. Yeah, I think the uniforms are the same, but they're throwing out some cool retro helmets with the old, old Benny on there uh, in, in orange and black uh, uh, clad. So that'd be cool to uh, check out for sure. But, um, TJ, what are your thoughts on this game? Both teams come in four and two. Um, Oregon State's favored, as we expected last week. It's close, but they are favored. And, you know, I, I think. Oregon State is in need of some home cooking at like the worst time. Yeah, I think so too. It'll be good to see the defense back at home because as we've seen, like just the sample is just too, it's too definitive. The, the, they just play just unbelievably better at home than they do on the road. So, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how they, they face Cam Ward. Who's thrown, he's thrown a lot this year. He's had some problem right. turnovers. I'd imagine he might turn the ball over once and twice in this game. 
They're pretty injured. Renard Bell's out. Uh, the running yep. back's out as well. What's his name? Um, uh, Nakia Watson, I believe. Yeah, Nakia Watson is out. And, you know, they've inserted a freshman in there, Jenkins, who did their leading receiver and rusher last week at USC. Right. But I, uh, from what I can tell, they're pretty thin behind him. So that'll be interesting to see if he gets worn out or, well, I, right. I'm not, no one hopes for injuries. But if he gets hurt, right, what, what happens there for Washington State? And it's been a really kind of up and down year. You know, they had the win at Wisconsin, but Wisconsin, as we realized, probably isn't all that good. They right. you know, fired Paul Christ, et cetera. Um, you know, they, they played very well against Oregon, who very well might be the best team in the conference, uh, as we can. Uh, I know people don't want to hear that, but they, they very well might be. They're pretty good. Um, you know, just, just ask, you know, just got to throw this in there. If, if the guy that's, you know, taking snaps in Eugene was taking snaps in Corvallis, this Oregon state team might be six and zero. but I digress. I digress. And it can come back to like the conversation we're having that like quarterbacks don't necessarily need to win you games, but they could definitely lose you games. Yeah. Right. And yep. we can almost directly tie the, the two losses to quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to have the guy. Right. So yeah. I mean, we we can play the if and or but game all yeah all, all right. Day. What's yeah? Um, what's that old saying, TJ? Uh, if 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 they were cookies and butts, man, we'd be uh, you know it's 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 true. It's it's one of those things where quarterback play is so absolutely important, especially in this conference. You're seeing it all levels of football, right? How did the Cincinnati Bengals go from being one of the worst run franchises the last 10, 15 years to the Super Bowl last year? Some Burrow. good drafts, but mostly Joe freaking Burrow, right? Yeah, like I, Joe Burrow and some luck, yes. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Right? A quarterback. And, and, and you, you know, can look at the two best teams in the conference this year, UCLA and Oregon. Yeah. And what – I mean, USC – okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, throw the Trojans in there USC. They, We'll throw the Trojans in lose. there too, even though Caleb Williams has been just a little underwhelming <laughs> in the last few weeks, especially yeah. during conference play. He really hasn't per se lit it up. Right. Um, so we look back to like the Washington State USC game last week. The defense really won that game for USC. I mean, right. Caleb Williams again completing about fifty percent of his passes uh, under two hundred yards. Um, but it was it, you know they still put up thirty points, but the defense right. held Washington State to fourteen points, which kind of gives you some confidence that the Oregon State defense can do the same to you know some electric players like Cameron Ward and company. Right. And I think that the, I think that's a good point. You know, Washington State, obviously, I think they've 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 come down a little bit. You know, you talk about that. They had kind of that emotional loss to Oregon the same way that Oregon State had an emotional loss to USC. The games were different. Um, but like, you know, Washington State, as I recall, TJ, they were up by like 14 in the fourth yeah. quarter against Oregon and, you know, blew that cooped it as they, uh, they like to say up there uh, on the Palouse mm -hmm. uh, from time to time. And, you know, then they bounced back against a Cal team that, you know, I, I, I don't think is going to be world beaters this year. And, you know, then obviously lose to USC. Um, the thing about Washington state that uh, I'd be curious about for this matchup, TJ, I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Cameron Ward is not like, you know, he doesn't have positive rushing yards on the year. I had to double check that. He's actually negative rushing yards, but he's got a touchdown. I was going to say, isn't that from Sacks? That would be from Sacks. Right. Though. And, and you look at like, you know, where um, Oregon, like last week, Tanner McKee, that dude was never going to take off and run. Not once, no. not any way, not, not in any sense of the word. Now you go back to the last two weeks before that. Um, Cam Rising, excuse me, was Utah's leading rusher, had 80 yards on the ground that game. Caleb Williams only had like 37 yards, TJ, on the ground against the Beavers. But uh, tell me that kept did not, that game alive. Tell me he, that did he, not feel like 150, right? And and he 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 almost he almost well, he won the game with his feet, right? Because if right. he doesn't use his feet, they don't convert that fourth down on that in the right. on that final drive of the game. So. So no, so again, despite Cam not having like the the necessarily like the rushing yards to back it up, that's my matchup going into this into this game. TJ is whether or not Oregon State can lock down a mobile quarterback in, and especially having the plus of having it at home because, again, I don't think Cam Ward's first instinct is to go out there and take off and run and pull on the zone read like we saw with Cam uh, Cam Rising as much. But he's quick. He's got a good pocket presence, and he's topped, mm -hmm. I think, 350 yards twice or real close to uh, impactful play. So he can sling it, uh, too. So 
I think if the Beavers can find a way to do anything like USC did these last, you know, last week and not get into a shootout with Washington state, like Oregon did, uh, I think they've got a shot. Yeah, again, I think a lot of this hinges on the defense because we don't know yeah. what – who's playing quarterback on Saturday. Nope. We don't. Not not yet. Well, I, I'm guessing it's going to be Ben, but we, we don't know for certain. We'll, we'll probably right. know on Friday. So that will leave it up to the defense. The defense has been the one that has been winning you games at home, essentially. That Boise State game, the offense played well, but the defense forced four turnovers. Four turnovers, four, yeah. Four, yeah. Right, yeah. the USC game nearly won. That was because of your defense. So yep. I think it's going to be the Oregon State defense that is going to have to win again. But they need to pressure the quarterback. Not just pressure. They can't let Cam Ward out of the pocket, like we said, to right. you know run around and give people headaches and people call into our station and complain that nobody can <laughs> tackle a quarterback. So, so I, I, would just, I would just prefer that. Uh, that. I'm sure Oregon State would too, right? Because – you know, you gotta just you gotta keep them in the pocket. When you get your arms around them, you gotta get them to the ground. That that is that is very very important. I'm trying to see if there's any other really notable numbers here for for Washington State. I mean, a total offense wise, Brendan, they're really low on the total offense totem pole. They're they ninety second nationally in total offense, which really kind of surprised me. And their rushing offense is, I, I think it's probably just for a lack of trying. To be honest, one hundred and nineteenth as well on the red zone offense is is pretty good as well. Uh, they they score about ninety five point seven percent of the times, um, but I'm looking. You know, there's opportunities here for for the Oregon State passing game to really uh, to really to flourish a little bit against the secondary. Right. I mean, they're hundredth in in yardage per game passing wise, eighty seventh in passing efficiency. Um, they yeah, let's see. I mean, they do get a lot of tackle for losses, and they do sack the quarterback a lot. So that'll be, I guess, a good matchup there. Right. Oregon State offensive line versus Cougar defensive line, and something Certainly. that Ben's going to assuming Ben is going to need to be careful of uh, operating the pocket. I mean, you heard him talk yesterday. He was uh, a couple of the biggest things he messed up on was was you know pulling a Russell Wilson and walking right into a sack. Um, when a guy's coming around the corner. So that's right. something I guess he needs to, to do a little bit better uh, as he looks forward here against uh, an aggressive Washington State defense. Never uh, never a free moment to take a shot at Russell Wilson, eh? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you, you can always count on that. You can always let's count ride. on that. <laughs> well, that's right. I, I don't know how many Denver Bronco fans we have that listen to this podcast. First of all, you're all welcome. Everybody's welcome to listen to the Edge podcast. Where else would you want to be if you're a Beaver fan? But, you know... Sorry, Second Bronco off, fans. I'm sorry. The Bronco <laughs> fans, they may have bit off a little more than they could chew with this one. But, you know, we'll see, right? No one, uh, all, all jokes aside, uh, you know, going back to the Beavs, I think it's going to be interesting, TJ, because I think it was painfully clear in the last two weeks. And correct me if I'm wrong, Chance Nolan, when healthy and right, is still the best quarterback on this roster. Without and, a doubt. I don't think I don't think that should be a question. People yeah. people love to to question yeah. that fact that he should be benched, yep. etc. I'm like, yep. Give me a better option. Where yep. is it? And, and I, I think I don't see it. I think he's the best option on this roster. And the fact that like Tristan Jebby has apparently hung up the cleats. I mean, you know, you know, it's just like coach like coaching role not even you know considered or mm -hmm. you know regardless. You know, regardless. And you know, maybe that's say, just the. People were like, really asked, where's Tristan? Why, why isn't Tristan playing? I'm like, if Tristan was going to run this offense more successfully than Ben right. was, he would play. I agree. Right. So that's, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think that's the thing that, you know, sometimes the fans that, you know, support the teams don't quite always seem to wrap, wrap their heads around fully, TJ. It's like, you know, sometimes every now and again, you get a case where a backup comes in and he does outplay the starter. But nine times out of 10, the guy is a backup for a reason, right? Yeah. He didn't beat out the starter for a reason. Now, again, there are plenty of cases of it's like, hey, you know, some teams have the benefit of, you know, taking out their starter and going to a guy who's another five stars, the backup, right? Then that backup mm -hmm. looks good. Oregon State, you know, doesn't quite have that benefit and only has just a couple quarterbacks they could go to in a given, you know, season. And, you know, you look at it, Chance, I think, can run the offense most effectively. I think his ability to have pocket awareness uh, is also, you know, yeah. important when we saw, you know, Ben play this last weekend. And 
I don't know, TJ. You know, I, I obviously heard Jonathan say uh, on Monday that Chance was not going to practice on Tuesday. But if Chance Nolan can get one day of practice this week, and I'm the coaching staff, got to go with him, man. Maybe yeah, he I'm knows wrong. this offense. Yeah, Maybe I mean, he, wrong, he knows the offense but, better than the other ones. But I, I just, I, I, I don't think like unless he really can't play. Maybe he's not healthy. Like it, I don't think Oregon State's offense benefits from having a, a quarterback battle when there really shouldn't be. Respectfully. Yeah, and again, we watched all three of these guys throughout the fall. It was pretty yes, clear who was going to be the starter. It, it was not a question for us, even right. though they left it up in the air. It was. Or yeah, really, three really wasn't race, a concern. And, and as long as Chance is out, I feel like we're going to have this discussion every week, and I'm going to keep yep. reminding people. Chance had two really, or you know, sorry, two, uh, doing oh two and uh, two and a quarter really bad games. I mean, just atrocious. Not not gonna. No, I'm losing track of things. No, One and a quarter, a, a, just a game and a, a half. game and a quarter. Uh, and a quarter yeah, well, okay, we'll, we'll do a half. Yeah, yeah, somewhere atrocious there. games. He played terrible. Guys play bad. It happens, right? Especially facing what looked like two of the best teams in the conference. Defenses specifically. Defenses yeah. specifically, yeah. But that doesn't take away the fact he's not a starter. <laughs> he, uh, no, 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 sorry. That that he is the starter. Like, right. Do you want to win? Because he will be the guy who's <laughs> going to win, win you games. He already has. Right. He's already shown that he can go do it. And it's all about, you know, just executing better, making better decisions. But that doesn't take yeah. away from the fact that he is the best option. Right. And not like I'm going to sing, sit back here and this isn't, you know, the defending Chance Nolan podcast. But if we wanted to go back and nitpick TJ of those six interceptions that he threw, could you make the claim that maybe only half of them are really on him? You know, if maybe four try out and, of let's six are on him. Try and think. Right? Yeah, I would, I would say probably four out of six, right? The two Utah ones were pretty bad. I think one yep. of those, well, Cl- uh, Clark Phillips really just made an unbelievable oh, play. Did. I think one of them, I remember, the, like, the, the pick Dixon, six was the pick six one was bad. Was bad. That I think was the bad. first yeah. one was more of a Clark Phillips is really good play. The USC ones, the first two were on him. Absolutely. Yeah. The third one I didn't necessarily think was on him because right. he made like a he threw the ball to the right spot in the end yeah. zone against USC and Tyjon Lindsay just got That's bullied right. by the corner. He did and the corner yeah. picked it off. Which in that case, if it's one on one, you're trusting a receiver to go win, and he didn't. And the stat goes on the quarterback, not the receiver, but the right. receiver might have been the one who who d- did it. And then at the end, you know, in that last drive, you're just trying to force the issue and get in a field goal range. Um, and right, couldn't do it. So I guess, I, I don't know, like when you think about it that way and you're like, well, you know, maybe, you know, the like, like you said, he had a, a game and a quarter, game and a half of just, you know, not great football. You know, maybe spending some time, you know, now off for, you know, a week will kind of reset and clear his head just because his his mojo didn't look right. His swagger didn't look right. And we know Chance Nolan is a guy who, you know, can go out there and, you know, he ignited the offense when he was named starter before. He kind of has that moxie, that it factor. And that's why Oregon State was successful at times with him at quarterback uh, last year and obviously early this year. So uh, my stance hasn't changed. I'm with you there, TJ. I still think when he's healthy, there's no competition. I think Chance Nolan's still this team's QB1. And I think Oregon State will have a much better chance to win if he's able to go out there on Saturday. Whether or not that's the case, we'll see. And I still think they can win. But, you know, uh, I, I think they're, they're, they're definitely better off uh, with him out there. But, yeah. again, the game itself, uh, Oregon State, a three-and-a-half point favorite. Do you think mm-hmm. that's pretty fair, I was going to say – I wonder if that Vegas line is for Ben or Chance. I would I say wonder. for Ben. For Ben, if Which I were to is guess. Interesting. So how much does it move if you put Chance in there? Doesn't it doesn't move at if, all. If I were an odds maker, which I'm not, maybe in a future life. <laughs> 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 move to Vegas and be an odds maker. Um, I'd maybe Chance Nolan's probably good for what, two points? Maybe make Oregon State a five well, and a half. You move point it to maybe? a yeah, five and a half, six and a point six and a half, although that seems like kind of a kind of a big line for this game. I thought it would be three and a half with chance. Interesting. Okay. So I don't know. It could be, it could be, it could be. Maybe I that, mean, that's what, that's what my, you know, sort of gut feeling looking at this game would be, which right. it's interesting, but you're, your favorite at home. So go out there and win the game. Yeah, certainly. And I, and I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, like I said, Oregon state had, you know, after that USC loss, TJ, and, and we talked about just how emotional that game was and, and I think maybe we underscored and perhaps didn't, you know, entirely 
say how maybe emotionally draining it was, right, for the team. Because I think we saw that hangover lead into Utah and then even, you know, that hangover maybe even lead into Stanford a little bit. I think going on the road after a loss like that, not for one week, but two straight weeks, I think that was tougher than, than, than you know, we, we talked about going into it. And yeah. I think that's where to kind of put a bow tie on this podcast heading into, you know, Saturday is, you know, Oregon State needs some home cooking. You know, that atmosphere, you were there at Research Stadium for USC was electric. You could yep. feel the electricity in the air. I'm surprised my, my hair didn't stick up, man. And it was, you know, that's exactly what this team needs because – at times, particularly TJ against Stanford, it mm-hmm. was a little like a zombie OSU squad out there. Yeah, and I feel like their energy really reflected from the ESPN cameras showing all the people <laughs> asleep in the stands. So, which I thought was pretty. Funny. That was a painfully um, tough TV broadcast to watch. I just have to put that, that was. Out there. I thought um, RG three was good. I I thought Mark Jones didn't really do his thorough research on how to pronounce a lot of guys' names, especially yeah. Brian Lindgren. How hard is that? Yeah, really? that's ridiculous. How many times I mean, did Mark Jones mispronounce Brian Lindgren's name? Uh, I, I, but do we need uh, to? Do do sh- it's, it's not even on the pronunciation guide yeah. because it is as it sounds, Lindgren. Well, and it's like, do we need the crowd shots, TJ, of the Stanford students passing around an Aquafina bottle of some yellow substance? Yeah, or, it's like, yeah, know, suck alcohol sleep, into the stadium. Or, or, you know, RG3, you know, circling groups of, you know, students or this or that. Like, Ugh. I was like, you know, um, uh, uh, Casey Holdall is uh, the Trailblazers digital reporter. And he, you know, I, I believe, you know, Casey Holdall is, you know, a Duck fan, but I, he had maybe the tweet of the night, TJ, when he threw up there probably, I don't know, a quarter or so in, it was, hey, at ESPN, this is a seven-point game. Act like it. And it, it just, it kind of hit true to me because it just seemed like to me, TJ, the, the broadcast was a bit of a joke to the guys there. For It was almost like, kind of like just making fun of the atmosphere a little bit. Yeah. It felt like. And it's like, like, okay, whatever. So if it was Bama, Tennessee this weekend in a top 10 matchup, are they going to show, you know, no, no. <laughs> just pick, start picking people out in the crowd to like sort of hover the yeah. camera Be around. like, oh, this person sacked out of sleep. Oh, they woke up. I mean, it's like, come on, man. Come on. I, I just, yeah, that was one of the, like for all, those Beaver, for all those Beaver fans that were like, get off Pac-12 network. Well, at least Pac-12 Network doesn't do those kind of crowd shots. So no, they don't. I mean, nope. It's 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 you know Beavers just can't win, man. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Pac-12 Network, uh, Oregon State back on uh, the big old uh, Pac-12 Network this Saturday night against Washington State, six o'clock at Research Stadium. Again, Oregon State a three and a half point favorite. Make sure to stay locked to BeaversEdge.com. We'll have complete coverage uh, leading up to the matchup. Uh, TJ will have his prediction. We'll also uh, hear from Dylan, our recruiting guy as well, get mine, see if the Beavers uh, are going to push it to 5-2 and two and get to one win away from bowl eligibility or if Washington State might come into Reister Stadium with a good game plan. And then we'll also have injury report. Uh, the visitor list as Oregon State will be having uh, some official visitors uh, back on uh, campus after being on the road for a couple weeks. So definitely a, a lot going on at beaversedge.com and definitely the place to be. Uh, TJ, thanks for jumping on the big pod, man. Definitely looking forward to uh, the game this weekend. And uh, uh, I, I, I did hear you're going to be uh, up in Seattle this weekend. Yes, so have a good yeah, time, no, man. I will not. I'll not and, get to watch uh, homecoming, but it should yeah, be. Uh, I'm sure, time. Brendan, you could take care of everything without me. Game three on Saturday, that should be a, a fun one. Yeah, go uh, go M's for you, man. I hope uh, I I hope it's a good game for you, and it should. Uh, I'm definitely uh, even though I'll be in Corvallis, I'm very happy to be there. It'd be really fun to be a part of a playoff atmosphere up there in Seattle. So best of luck to you, man. Enjoy, and uh, thanks for uh, coming on the pod, man. Yeah, of course. It's really kind of weird missing a game day, but I'll take uh, take the one I can get. So here we go. No doubt. Looking no forward doubt. to it. <laughs> hey, you know, apparently, you know, you, you never know when, when you know, Mariners postseason is, is a rarity. So you got to take advantage uh, yeah, of it, Yeah, right? especially a home so, game, right? So exactly, I was like, well, what exactly. if I have to wait another 20 years? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, again, thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Edge Podcast. Uh, TJ and I will be back next week. We'll be breaking down uh, the Washington State game and uh, looking ahead to Oregon State's uh, matchup with Colorado to uh, officially uh, kick off the, uh, the, the kind of second half and the meat of the schedule. So, again, uh, Oregon State 
uh, set to face Washington State this weekend, 6 p.m. at Reeser Stadium. Make sure to keep it locked, beaversedge.com. Uh, we'll have continuous coverage from myself, TJ, and Dylan, Dylan Callaghan-Crowley uh, leading up to the matchup. So stay tuned, beaversedge.com.